right, good evening, everyone. How are you tonight? Great, thank you. Appreciate you being here. Um, my name is Jay Stevens. I'm superintendent of Reading Community City Schools. I'd like to welcome all of you to our community town hall tonight. Uh, we have a couple of different ways that this is being broadcast and streamed for future reference. I'd like to thank, first of all, Mr. Joe Ellis, who is here uh, streaming tonight on Facebook Live for us. And we are also streaming on YouTube Live, as we typically do for our board meetings and other types of events. So we have that on our district YouTube channel, and that will be available at any time once this is over tonight. I'd also like to uh, give a couple of acknowledgments here tonight uh, with some thanks. Ms. Warnery, our board president, is here tonight to join us. Uh, also, Mayor Bemis has joined us this evening, so thank you for being here to both of you. It's always great to have you here at Independence. <clears throat> Our format tonight is uh, dedicated to uh, a slide presentation. Some of you may have seen this previously, or at least portions of it, as we have been sharing a lot, a lot of the same message over the past several weeks, but also modifying the message as we continue to be out about the community, sharing, uh, sharing our story and getting feedback from our community members. So we continue to modify this a little bit, as well as have some frequently asked questions. Um, what I will do here in just a moment is get the, the presentation start, and once we get through that presentation, uh, this will be an open mic set up for questions and answers. Um, again, so that everyone will be able to see and hear, we have a microphone and stand over on this side. And for those that have questions, if you would just approach one at a time for, for questions, hopefully we'll be able to get these uh, answered to your satisfaction. I can tell you if we don't have an answer, we will find an answer and we will get back to you. So if you will bear with me for just a moment, for those of you watching on our YouTube live channel, uh, I will share my screen so you'll be able to see that just a little bit easier. And we'll have that uh, for future presentations as well. Just a moment, please. All right, I believe we are all set at this point. Again, our goal tonight is to give you a lot of information that is important for our school district up on May 3rd. I'm hoping that everyone here at this point knows we are on the ballot on May 3rd. Uh, this is a very important levy for our district. It's 9.99 mills continuing operating. Uh, this will generate approximately $208,000 for one mill, which is $2 million per year for our district. The last new operating request was in 2009. And if you're asked the question, wait a minute, I've seen you on the ballot since then, you would be correct. Uh, there have been renewals of that original 2009 uh, levy, which was in 2012, and a substitute levy in 2018. And then we were also on the ballot in 2015 for the bond issue that built the building that we're in here tonight. If we are not successful, uh, the reductions have already been uh, broadcast previously and shared at board meetings as well as out in the public. We'll be looking at approximately $1.3 million in reductions uh, for the next school year. These are permanent reductions for 22, 23, and beyond. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. This is the timeline of events that really I've kind of already shared a little bit, uh, just so you can see that uh, on screen. And again, for future, you can take a little bit closer look at it. I think it's important to add to it with this timeline of events that there have been previous reductions in place here in our school district. Uh, back in the November 2019 five year forecast, it was identified at that time that we had to, I may have to change my buttons, but I'll try one more time. That back in 2019, there was an identified need for additional funds. Um, that was in November of 2019, and there was a full expectation that we would be on the ballot in 2020. As we all know, 2020 was a little bit better for everyone. And of course, we had to uh, live through the beginning of the pandemic and state reductions in funding. That required an additional savings for the district because we were lacking in that revenue from the state. All told, it was approximately $1.8 million worth of reductions. But still, there was an expectation needed to be on the ballot. So what what was the lifeboat for us, if you want to call it that, we've used that phrase a number of times, were what we call federal ESSER funds. Those were pandemic relief funds that came to the district in three separate waves. 
And those funds were kind of like stimulus package type things, school districts. And that was allowed to be used for current operating planned expenses um, that we've been able to utilize to offset our current expenditures and extend the need for our a levy campaign all the way until 2022. And of course, back in January, the Board of Education did approve the resolution and the recommendation from the Finance Committee, some of which are in here tonight, thank you, uh, for the May 3rd uh, levy campaign, 9.99 mills. One of the first things that people ask with they, any type of levy campaign is what's it gonna cost? And so that's one of the first things we wanna talk about tonight. And, there are some generalities here with uh, values of homes uh, at 100,000 and 200,000. Those are a range to be thinking about. But on average, uh, with those kind of home values, we'd be looking at approximately $29, $30 per month to up all the way to $60 per month. Again, rough numbers to be looking at. The actual numbers are on screen. But that will lead us to the next topic, which is something that is probably one of the things we've heard the most during this last couple of months. And that is a very serious misconception about how the taxes are raised. And so what I've done is I've utilized an example from one of our staff members who at this point will remain nameless. And you will see on, on here that uh, we have some blocked out owners names at the home, just so that we can use this as an example. But this shows that, uh, again, real life example, uh, 184 Waxwing is the property we're talking about. And the sale price of that home back in 2021, just over a year ago, just under a year ago, I'm sorry, was $240,000. So one of the things that, excuse me, one of the, the things that we keep hearing is that the sale price of homes have gone up tremendously, and, and they have. It's been across the board, across the state, everywhere. That sale price, though, has absolutely nothing to do with which taxes are collected. This is an example again from the Hamilton County Auditor's website. Wow, 4184 Waxwing. And if you would like to do this for your own property, you can do it at any time. The market value that you can see, uh, again, remember this was a $240,000 purchase. The market value from Hamilton County Auditor is actually 176. And we're going to use round numbers just to make it easier. But let's say it's $176,000. The assessed value is 35% of that number, just under $62,000. That's where the green arrows are pointing. So again, we're not paying taxes on the $240,000 price. We're paying taxes on the assessed value of the home as the Hamilton County Auditor identifies that. <clears throat> so off to the right-hand side, we've got a quick calculation. And that calculation shows, again, the purchase price of $240,000. The market value is one seventy-six. dollars the assessed value, which is 35% of that number, is just under $62,000. That is what we're, the tax rate is based upon. The new tax levy of being 9.99 mills times 0 0.001, that's the value of a mill, gives us $61.91. Multiply that by 9.99 mills, we get a total of $618.48 per year. And if you divide that by 12 months, the monthly rate for this property is $51.54 per month as a result of this upcoming uh, tax levy. That's a lot of mathematics. <clears throat> as a former math teacher, I don't mind doing that. However, not everybody wants to do that calculation. Uh, the Hamilton County Auditor's website does have a tool for this, so you can put in your address and you would be able to find out what this would be for you on your property. Unfortunately, at this point, it is still not updated. At the very top, you'll see it there where it says levy information in red, in white letters, it says no proposed levies found. I can assure you we are on the ballot. <laughs> Unfortunately, this data is not uploaded to be able to find it immediately. So you can use this calculation to do it for yourself or within the next couple of weeks is what we were told that we will have that tool ready to go so you can put it in for your property value or your property address, I should say, and it will do this calculation for you. One of the other misconceptions that we hear quite a bit is House Bill 920, um, and which goes back in history to 1976. And again, this is uh, a, a, the, the reason behind this is that, again, property values uh, have gone up. The tax bills have also gone up. However, 
They have not gone up for school districts. We've not received additional revenue because of the increase in the tax bill. That has to do with House Bill 920. And essentially what House Bill 920, with a lot of words there, says in a very big nutshell, we are on a fixed income. So if your property tax bill went up, which it probably did for most of you, maybe all of you, if you look at how much the schools brought in from that tax bill over the past several years, you will see that continues to remain very flat, very constant and consistent. We have not seen additional revenue as a result of the, you know, the higher property taxes. <clears throat> so again, there's a lot of words there to understand and we might hear something called effective millage. That is what the, the amount of the money that is actually, or the millage that generates the same amount of money from when a levy was voted in. You might see that on your tax bill, uh, which again is part of the tax um, concern that many people have. And it, it's a hard concept to understand. If you don't take away anything else tonight, I hope that you will take away the fact that because we, because of House Bill 920, school districts are on a fixed income. And having not asked for additional revenue from, from the community since 2009, we've been looking on that fixed income for nearly 13 years now. It's a great segue to understanding, I think we all, we all understand that inflation is happening. It's in the news all the time. Uh, if you think back to 2009, what the, the value of a dollar was, this is a table showing what it's equal to now. Um, it's not a hard concept. I'm not gonna read through this, but very simply put, the value of a dollar is not the same back in 2009 as it is today. In other words, the purchasing power has gone down pretty significantly. If you had a $60,000 income in 2009 and you didn't receive any additional funding since 2009 in your own home budget, I think we all understand that we couldn't purchase the same amount of things that we could purchase back in 2009 on the same income. That's because everything has gone up in price. Electricity bills, water bills, groceries. Uh, obviously, right now, the most visible for us is the signs on the gas stations. Those have gone up. What you, what you could buy today is significantly less than what you could buy with the same amount of money in 2009. I think we understand that concept. It's the same exact issue for school districts, however. Since we've renewed the same levy twice without additional revenue, we are essentially living with the same amount of revenue that we had in 2009. We have, as a school district, had increased costs as well. Salaries and benefits go up for staff members, our light bills go up, our water bills go up, operational expenses go up. So we are not able to have the same amount of purchasing power now that we had back in 2009. Again, it's important to note that there's already been reductions that have happened to the tune of $1.8 million just two years ago. I use this example of something that we see often on the news back in the, in the fall of the year. It's that cone of uncertainty for a hurricane. And for man, the science on their buff, for those of us that are, and I'm one of them, you see these to happen all the time uh, in the fall. And it's a very good analogy for what we call a five year forecast in schools by requirement, by law. Uh, Ms. Burke, who is here with us tonight, our school district treasurer, is required to file a forecast twice a year and it's approved by the Board of Education in May and in November. Just like with a certainty for a hurricane, what's going to happen in the next 12 to 24 hours is probably pretty certain. That forecast is pretty clear. The further it gets out in that cone, the more variables create movement and that track is going to change. A five-year forecast is exactly like that. What we can see right in front of us in the next couple of months is probably clear. What we don't always know is what's going to happen a year away, two years away, five years away. It's an educated guess, but it's based upon a lot of different factors. And I've got some of those listed off the right hand side. Buying in budgets that come from the state and what that allocation is for school districts is a major factor. Our staffing requirements, insurance premiums, federal grants, negotiated agreements, property tax collection rates, and the list goes on and on. All of these factors that our treasurer and our district utilizes every time we have to do a five-year forecast and it's constantly changing. This is an example of a five-year forecast. Sorry, it's 
cutting a little bit behind. There we go. This is a five-year forecast that the uh, finance committee was looking at, at when it was proposing the, the 9.99 well operating levy. It's a lot of numbers, and I don't expect for you to read all of those or understand all of those. I'm going to point out a few key items. We have fiscal years, which our financial people always look to and talk about fiscal year 22, fiscal year 23, but the school district, for our purposes, we can look at what that actual year is. So fiscal year 22, which is what we are in now, is the school year 2021, 2022, currently what we're in. That will change when we start the next school year with fiscal year 23, and it will go on this forecast all the way through the 27, 28 school year. What's really important to note here is the blue box around the 24, 25 school year or fiscal year 25. If our levy is successful, you will see in the blue box below, it says we will be in a positive number of $2.4 million in 24, 25. Without being successful in May, we are, we are negative $2.6 million. By law in the state of Ohio, school districts cannot operate in the negative. So one of two things has to happen. We have to increase revenue or decrease expenditures or both. So when we talk about $1.3 million in reductions if we're not successful, that comes from that $2.6 million in the hole in 24-25. And you might ask the question, that's a few years away. Why are we talking about this now? Well, one of the things that happens with school districts is from five-year forecast, the state looks at it and monitors it and will start to question our district about looking ahead and being in the negative and requiring a plan to change that. Okay, that'd be a fiscal watch status. Our goal is to avoid that because whether we are forced to do it from the state of Ohio or we do it because we know that there's a problem coming, either way, we have to take corrective action. So essentially what this means is once our school year ends this year, we are then within the window of two years out of not being able to make payroll or pay our bills. We would not receive enough revenue to offset our expenditures. We will have to take care of that in advance if we're not successful in May. And what does that look like? These are permanent reductions. And I got a little feedback on this word permanent. Nothing's ever permanent. Uh, maybe that's true. But what I will tell you is there's no clear pathway to bringing back these reductions. And maybe that's a little bit better way of saying it because permanent reductions, the reason they're being stated as permanent is any change to this would have a negative impact on the five-year forecast in the future. So the conversation amongst our administrative team with the Board of Education is permanency means that they don't come back because if they do come back, we take much bigger bites out of our ending cash balance and it would require either other reductions or coming back for additional revenue much sooner. So we talk about these in permanent reductions because again, all those variables may have an influence in the future, but as of what we know right now, permanency is, is where the, the plan is. It's 23 and a half positions. Um, again, we use some, some really general averages for teaching salaries and benefits, uh, which is the largest part of our, our budget. 80 to 85% is true for all districts. We fall in that general category. But $1.3 million is what we would have to save. This will come, again, primarily with staffing, teaching staff. Uh, We'll have increased class sizes because of fewer staff members. We will have decreased programming uh, and course offerings. That includes elementary specials. That includes elective course offerings yet to be determined at the junior senior high. We'll have to shorten our school day at the junior senior high level um, in order to make our schedule work. And of course, decreased operational support. That includes secretaries. That includes uh, custodial maintenance, guidance counselor, dean of students, administration. Essentially, every aspect of the district is, is touched by $1.3 million. The last thing that's on here is our paid, so paid fees. Uh, there is funding from our general fund that helps the athletic budget. However, as part of the savings that essentially keeps us from having one additional staff member reduced, the pay to participate goes from $75 to $200 based upon our current levels of participation in our athletic program. That will pay for things like transportation, uniforms and other things that are, that are transferred from our district budget to the athletic department budget. Put a little bit differently, this is what those reductions look like. 
with our current level of staffing and what our future staffing would look like. Um, again, this is across the entire district. You can see that the specialist teaching positions would be eliminated. And we see fewer numbers of elementary teachers. We see fewer numbers of teachers in each department that will have an impact on what we can offer for our students. For every teaching position at the secondary level, that is six less sections of courses that can be taught and offered for our students, just to give a little bit of perspective. Each teacher teaches six periods a day. If we take one out of each department, let's say one, one uh, social studies teacher, that is six less sections of social studies that can be offered for our students throughout the course of the day. There's some additional possible implications um, that we don't know sure, for sure how they will work out, but there has to be implications in some way. One of those is at the city level. And one of our city council members had a great conversation with her a few weeks ago and made the comment to me that if 23 and a half additional positions were reduced out of our district, that will have an impact on the income tax revenue that come to the city by being an employee of the district. I hadn't thought of it that way, but absolutely that's correct. Uh, there would be less income tax being collected. It would have an impact at the city level. There are unknown enrollment impacts, and you can't really quantify these just yet, but our residents that may seek additional or may seek other places to go to school because of the course offerings uh, is a possibility. The other possibility is the district may not attract as many open enrollment students. We currently have 333 open enrollment students in our district, and we turn away many applications every year. If this were to change, we would anticipate some kind of change to our open enrollment applications. Um, again, unknown what that would look like, but we would anticipate a change somehow. There is likely to be change in the property valuation at some point with properties. Um, the value of homes often is tied to the school district. Um, so again, unknown, not quantifiable now, but we anticipate some kind of change there. And even if we're not successful in May and the reductions were to happen, it can certainly be anticipated that that revenue stream still need, that need is still there. And there would be a potential levy on the ballot as early as November of 2022 if the Board of Education makes that decision. That would be if the $1.3 million already had happened and then we would still be out on the ballot again just six months later. Again, potentially uh, and very likely. So that is what is at stake for our district. And some people may ask again, why in May versus November? It goes back to the idea that we operate on a school year status. So if we are not successful, we are able to make those reductions at the end of this school year in preparation for the 22-23 school year and allows us to receive the full benefit of those reductions and the impacts on our five-year forecast and the bottom line would be realized over these next two school years. I'm going to talk just a little bit here about some similar districts to give some comparative data across uh, districts that are seen to be the same or similar according to the state of Ohio. You can readily find this on ODE's website uh, by looking at the similar district enrollment through ODE and or similar district uh, methodology. And we are a district uh, that has a lot of similar districts, 20 identified, just like every other school district, and many of them are, we don't know anything about. Um, if you look along this list, um, you may or may not know anything about most of these districts, but there are two in Hamilton County that, when we say their names, they have, they have some meaning to you in some way, and that is Norwood and Deer Park. They are both within our ODE similar district populations. <clears throat> So here's some data to show um, from the CUP report. And you can see at the bottom where that is cited. Again, it's on the ODE website. You can look at CUP report. And if you are really interested in some, some really interesting data uh, and have nothing else better to do than to look at that, please take some time because it's fascinating. There's about 60 or so uh, data marks uh, for every school district in the state of Ohio. And you can find out all kinds of information that is, again, readily available. I have pulled some of this. Um, and it wouldn't have made sense to do all 60 pieces, but there are some good comparative data uh, numbers to look at. In regards to average teacher salary, and I'm not going to read these two, you can look at them on screen, but the number of administrators, and I want to just I want to tell you that these numbers are accurate based on the cover report. I will tell you our friends over in Deer Park 
25 is not the accurate number of administrators, and I feel bad that that's on there, but it is what you would see if you looked it up on the cup report. Uh, I believe my good friend over there, uh, Jay Phillips, I believe he said there are actually 12 administrators uh, in Deer Park. It's not 25, but again, I don't want to put wrong data up there, and there was a data upload issue uh, at Deer Park. So for those of you that are watching and are looking at Deer Park's uh, numbers, that's where it comes from. We believe that to be completely an inaccurate number in fairness to them. We have assessed property value per pupil, what one mill generates per pupil in these districts. Operating expenditures per pupil. Again, this is an average number, and I don't really want to caution the use of average here. It is, when we look at operating expenditure per pupil, that is all expenses we have as a school district divided by all the number of districts, or all the number of students serve in the district. It's not a fair thing to say, nor is it anywhere close to being accurate, that one student costs our district $10,157 to, to educate. Okay, so there are all kinds of different costs associated with educating students. But again, this is an average number, and it is good comparative data to use when we talk about averages in comparison to other districts. The other thing that we see on here is our total revenue per pupil. And in every one of these metrics, what you will find is that we compare favorably to our districts that are compared to us here in Hamilton County. It also is showing very clearly that we have not as much revenue generated per student as other school districts in our county as well. So I'm going to transition to some of the frequently asked questions. Some of these we've addressed in the presentation already, um, and some of them we have not. So we'll kind of gloss over those that have already been addressed. But the first one is the Fair School Funding Plan. I thought this was going to help. The Fair School Funding Plan was uh, approved in the legislation last year. We are in year one of the Fair School Funding Plan. However, it is a six-year phase-in process. Over six years, that's three state biennial budgets. And we know that those things are going to change over time. It is uncertain and unknown whether the Fair School Funding Plan will be fully implemented. So we cannot account for that in our five-year forecast. How does open enrollment affect our district financially? This has been a topic. Here is the probably the most simplistic view of this. Uh, number one, there used to be a very simple calculation for how much money we received from the state based upon our open enrollment number. The Fair School Funding Plan has changed that calculation, and the truth is it's still trying to be fully understood, even at the state level. Uh, Ms. Burke and I have had a number of conversations with people who are much smarter than her and I that deal with this every single day, and they have not been able to fully and adequately explain what the implications are. What we can say very clearly though, and what's been very overly stated to us, we will not receive less funding for open enrollment students during this biennium than we received last year, and that is $1.9 million. So that's, that is something we can count on and what we can plan for. That calculation, though, is still something we are working to understand with our friends at the state or regional uh, kind of support staff, the finances. We have talked about property valuation and why the school district has not received additional funding. Uh, that was the House Bill 920 slide. Uh, really think that is a very important key item to hit. Property taxes have gone up, but the school district revenue has not gone up with it. It has remained flat. If the levy were to pass, when would we see uh, changes to a tax bill? That would be in 2023. So it passes May 3rd. It doesn't change anything on May 4th or June 4th or July 4th. It will wait until 2023. How much revenue has the recent TIF agreement generated? Or what about the due pipeline? Well, neither of those at this point have generated a single dime for our district. Now, we anticipate that to change some point in the future. But as of right now, the TIF agreement is solely dependent upon the future development of the property which the TIF agreement was agreed upon. And this is the Duke pipeline. We know that there's been a lot of construction work, but that's not currently pumping gas at this, point, at this time. So until it does, and we know what the implication is and what we can learn more about that entire process, uh, we cannot account for that because it's not known to date what that will look like. A hot topic a little while ago was fundraisers. 
Why aren't we doing fundraisers to help offset our operating expenses? By law, the district is not allowed to do that. Um, unlike uh, private schools that might be able to have large fundraising events, we are not permitted to do that uh, and, and generate funds that way. You might say, though, that our booster program, which is very operational and functional and is a huge support for our district for the athletic boosters, or let's say ETO, for example, that, that has fundraisers, those are not under our school district umbrella and they are their own separate entities. So they can do those fundraisers. And it looks like it's a school district fundraiser, but they are under, they operate as a separate entity and they donate their funds for the betterment of the school district. The last question on here, I've heard the district got money from the federal government. Why didn't they love you on the ballot? Well, those were the ESSER funds that I mentioned previously, those one-time payments that were very similar to what a lot of, a lot of you, a lot of uh, Americans receive from the government on the stimulus checks. That may have come to you, you may have used that for expenses, you may have done some kind of small home project, you may have put it away in the bank, who knows? Well, ESSER funds were very similar for us. We could use them for operating expenses that were already planned for. We could use them for new things that might be helpful to us, which we did uh, in certain cases, but the bulk of those funds went to offset our current expenses. And that is what has allowed us to extend our budget and the need for this levy two years past what was originally anticipated. Next question, how does this levy affect the stadium? The quick answer to that is, it just simply does not affect the stadium. It has nothing to do with the stadium other than we have a lease agreement with the city to use the stadium. We use our general operating funds to pay for that lease agreement. But otherwise, lobby has nothing to do with the stadium. What about Hilltop? I'm sorry, let's go Central first. That's the next question. Central property. Well, the Board of Education has taken action to maintain that property as a district asset. But as of this time, there have been no decisions made on what to do with the property into the future. However, the question has been, well, can the district sell it? Well, the board, if they were to choose to sell it, those funds that would be generated from the sale of that property would not be able to be used for general operating expenses. Then the last question is, what will it cost to maintain the Hilltop Athletic Complex? This is still yet to be determined in fullness because we do not have a full year of having access to it. Uh, we were surprised to learn we'll be able to play games on that field, weather permitting this year. Um, however, we will have a maintenance contract with our uh, field company to maintain the infields, uh, the warning tracks, do all of the uh, fertilizing and all the things that will help keep this growing and in good shape throughout the course of, of the year. There will be an additional amount that will be from mowing. That will be done through our, our maintenance provider on A360. And we could anticipate somewhere between $35,000 and $40,000 of maintenance on that property each year. It is also not on here, but I will say this uh, because, again, a frequently asked question. The debt service on this uh, the loan that was used, that you may have heard of previously called the COPS, the Certificate of Participation, that was used to build this, the Hilltop Athletic Complex, it was effectively a loan. Loans have to get paid back. Paying back that loan does require the use of general operating funds. So we will be um, using those to help pay back the loan over the next, I believe it's 12 years, is that correct? 12 years. So again, that is general operating funds along with the uh, maintenance of the fields. And this is a, the ongoing list of community conversations. We've now hit the March 21st uh, community town hall. We've got a number of different opportunities, uh, again, for more personalized one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations or small group uh, between now and April 30th. So with that being said, I'm going to turn my screen off uh, on the YouTube live version, and we'll be ready to start our question and answer. All right, so for our question and answer session, again, we do have the microphone up here. I'll get this turned on for you. Um, if you would, please, if you have a question, just step up and just step up to the mic so that everyone on YouTube and on Facebook will be able to hear you. And we'll do our best to answer your questions. Don't be shy. That's what we're here for.
Uh, this question came from Facebook, and it is, how many staff members does the school currently have, and what is the annual payroll? Total number of staff, we are at about 100 and 136 staff members. Uh, that does not include some of our purchase service staff members, however, we have a number of uh, entities that we work with that provide personnel. Uh, so that is part of the purchase service agreements that we go into with technology, with uh, maintenance and custodial. They are a part of us, they work with us, but they are not district employees. And the second part of that question was what's our total payroll? Payroll is $9.2 million per year. Just pay. Next question. I think you answered it somewhat. Uh, with the central property being vacant for so many years, how much does it cost to operate expenses currently as it is right now to mow and maintain it? The other thing is, if you guys are asking for a, a increase this significant, I really think you ought to consider selling it to eliminate some work. Uh, the other thing is now, I think you covered this somewhat too, should the levy fail? And I've heard this you know, way back a while ago with Locke, that the state would take over operation of the school levy. My question would be, why did the state let the school get so far in the red, maybe other districts? What is the schools doing to do to push state instead of going to the easiest resort and just asking taxpayers? Um, I may have to ask you to help me get through all these questions when you said we have a seat, but I will help I will answer all your questions for you, okay? Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of wondering about the state operating schools because that just doesn't make sense to me why they don't. You know, help schools that are underfunded and some are overfunded. They're in a balance. It is the question of my entire career, sir. Um, it has been uh, unconstitutional in the state of Ohio for the way that schools are funded since before I started my teaching career. And so that should answer some of the question that yes, the state should be doing things differently. I would tell you that the Fair School Funding Plan has been the best attempt at, at funding schools in a more fair and equitable way. However, as we know, as I mentioned earlier, it's in front of a six-year reason. And that's that's counting on future legislatures and state biennial budgets to continue implementing something that was passed in the last uh, legislative cycle. So I, I don't disagree with you, with you at all. Absolutely, the state should be doing things differently. It's been unconstitutional for 30 plus years. Uh, but there's not a lot we can do to change that of it, except for all the professional organizations and friends of education and lobbying for this to happen differently. And that was a lot of the work that you see with the Fair School Funding Plan has been in the making uh, by a lot of people involved, a, a number of different legislators were involved in and work groups. That has uh, gotten us to where we currently are, but we're nowhere near the full implementation of that plan. We talk about the state taking over and why doesn't the state do something different? We are not in jeopardy of the state taking over our district. Okay, we are not anywhere close to that. We are three years out, fiscal year three years out before we hit that negative mark. So we will not get to the point of the state coming in to take us over. We will do what it takes to stay out of the negative and whatever it means because getting to the point where a state taking over takes the local control out of the district. That is not what's going to happen. So we will be proactive, if not successful, and reduce our expenditures in accordance with what is projected to be in the five-year forecast, a problem year. And we can't by law operate the negative. So we'll be forced to do that. The state would, would come along and, and quote, help us do that eventually. Uh, but we will have to do that in advance before whatever gets to that point. Uh, we talk about the central property. Again, it is, it is a district property that could have some really great needs and uses in the future. And again, until we get past our current operating levy and knowing what our district financial status is, there's not been a decision made on what to do with the property going forward. Uh, we do entertain a uh, number of calls 
periodically about uh, places that might be interested in purchasing that property. But again, I would go back to the fact that even if it was sold, it does not go into a budget that would help with our general operating expenses. It would go into a different fund that could be used for other permanent improvement type of things, but not within our general fund. Um, for some kind of maintenance into the future, yes, that could probably be the way that money is used. But again, we're talking about operating funds, the day in and day out operations of the district. We would not be able to use the revenue from that property to pay for those everyday expenses. So that was one of the options that was considered by the, the finance committee. I'm sorry, this keeps coming out of me. The finance committee studied this issue uh, back in the fall of 2021 and looked at a number of different potential options. It would tell you that the potential software that we utilize to help forecast and look at modeling of our future made the recommendation that we really should be looking at 16 mills, not 9.99. So we all knew that that was not reasonable, but not going for more than nine, or I should say, for going for less than 9.99 did not get us much of a, a benefit into our, our five-year forecast. And then you run into something called levy fatigue. If we ask for, let's say, four or five mills, maybe that's what you might be referring to. You think about what 9.99 mills generates, roughly $2 million. Five mills only generates $1 million. So if you were to look at what our forecast would look like with only a million dollars increase, we really don't, we don't really do a whole lot for that forecast in the future. And we write back the following year for the district plan. So the, the the finance committee made the recommendation after studying this for a, for a couple of months that this would be the best chance scenario to get not what we need because we're not going to ask for 16 mills, but to get us pushed out far enough that we can wait and see if there are changes that are going to happen that will make things better for us in the future. Remember that cone of uncertainty with the five-year forecast? Lots of things can wiggle and fall around that might make a change for us in the future, but 9.99 was the recommendation from the finance committee based upon a number of different scenarios looked at. And the Board of Education approved that recommendation. Would you uh, go for a lesser amount of this time? It would be hard to say because we'd have to go back to the drawing board after making all those, all those cuts and see what that new revenue need is. I would not anticipate it being much less, but that would be for the finance committee to look at and for the Board of Education to take action on. Uh, but the revenue need is going to be there regardless of whether, you know, regardless of whether it's now or in November, it's still going to be the same. The difference will be, are we going to live through with those kind of reductions? Because we will be having to make those for the next school year if we're not successful. Again, going back to that whole question about the state, we're not going to let the state come in and take us over. So we have to take that preemptive step. Thank you for your questions. Those are good ones. So we talked about house values and how the increase doesn't go up based on what our current house values are today, uh, if this passes. If it does fail and it goes on to November or even next May when the ballot goes in, so my understanding that the auditor is making new assessments on values of homes next year, if, if, the, if my calculation is correct on that. Heard that or not, in 2023, that the auditor will be uh, assessing new home values. So it's on a triennial cycle every three years. Did it happen last year or 2020? Okay, so you're seeing the results of that now. Yes. So, if, if, so again, if it's based upon that timeline, that happens in 2023, the resulting doesn't it happen. wouldn't go into effect in 2020. Correct. Okay. So, never mind. <laughs> Your other questions.
Well, to do a little filling of the time, what I will tell you is that we will be pushing this new presentation out on our website uh, following our, our meeting here tonight. So it will be readily accessible. The video will be available on our YouTube live channel, and we will be pushing that out as well. I know that we have a number of people that are uh, allowed or taking that and putting it onto, onto Facebook, as well as Mr. Ellis. He's got his, his bit version uh, of Facebook Live tonight that I'm sure will be available uh, outside of our, our viewing this evening. Again, goal is to be able to provide information to help everyone understand our district situation and why it is so critical now. Uh, it's, it is a long time. Um, I think we have a great story to tell. There's a long history of fiscal responsibility. Uh, our Board of Education feels very strongly about not asking the community for funds that are absolute. And again, when the board was faced with this decision back in 2020, right at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a strong value that there was a whole lot of people hurting at that time. And to ask for those funds two years ago uh, just would not have been the appropriate thing to do. And, and again, along came the federal funds that helped to give that lifeboat and extend this to 2022. But the time is now, it is necessary. Um, I think, I hope that we've been able to demonstrate why it's necessary, what it looks like in our forecast and why the action that has to be taken now is so critical. Typically a school district would probably ask or be on the ballot once, maybe even twice with the, the amount of cuts that we're talking about. The difference for us right now is we've been living through the pandemic for two years. It's just not the right thing to do at that time. The federal dollars allowed us to ask longer than anticipated. And so here we are at the time of absolute, the first time being on the ballot. If it's not successful, of course, we'll see uh, significant impacts to our district with staffing so, and, and other operations as well. So with that being said, if there are no other questions tonight, thank all of you for attending and being tonight, as well as the watch this completely, uh, Facebook Live or on YouTube. Well, Said. I think the battery's gone. It's trying to tell me I should stop talking at this point. <laughs> With that, thank you very much.